Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SimScale webinar on thermal performance of lighting solutions. Thank you for joining us today. We are together for the next 30 minutes. And during that time, please feel free to interrupt us and ask us any questions or make any comment. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Arno. I'm a technical marketing specialist here at SimScale. I have a mechanical design uh, background. I've used CFD and APA for many years uh, as a part of my job. And I'm now part of the SimScale marketing team. And I'm involved in a number of projects throughout the industry uh, involving architectures, um, general engineering, electronics cooling, as we will see today. Uh, today, I have the chance to be uh, joined by uh, my colleague, Alex Fisher, who is uh, going to introduce himself. Yeah, also welcome from my side. My name is Alex uh, Fisher. I'm a co-founder of SimScale and right now I'm working as a product manager, leading our efforts in regards to all thermal management related solutions. So that obviously involves also the big part around electronics cooling and obviously also the lighting solutions, which is today um, the topic of this webinar. Um, I'll give you some introduction about what typical challenges that we see that our customers face and work with us um, on it. Um, and after the introduction um, of Arno about the company, we'll give you some insights to that. All right, let's give you a little bit of background about SimScale and who we are. So founded in 2012 in Munich, Germany. Uh, we are a very uh, international team uh, based mainly, as I said, in Munich, Germany and on the East Coast of the US. So uh, we're growing extensively. Uh, we're more than, I think, 85 people, I think I saw recently. So growing a lot in all different teams and um, and, and expanding fast. Um, so what do we do? So we are proposing an engineering simulation platform that you can access from anywhere you are through your browser and enabling you to simulate your design through fluid dynamics, solid mechanics, and thermodynamics. So um, it, this goes from preparing the setup, simulation, simulation of the setup, and the post-processing of the result. Let's dive into today's application and how, it's, how we're going to uh, take advantage of cloud-based CFD. Yeah, great. So I take it from here. Um, the application we're going to show you today is um, exactly a natural convection case of a lighting device, an LED lighting device. And we're going to simulate this with our new conjugate heat transfer solution. So the solver essentially or the analysis type that treats um, all the different uh, mechanisms of heat loss that are important for lighting devices. So that's obviously the conduction in the solid parts, that's the convection of the flow field outside, but also the thermal radiation to the outside. Um, we uh, introduced a new solver um, for exactly this that speeds up the time um, a lot. I know we'll show us um, later how you can actually use this um, and how it's integrated into our platform. And before we start into this, we will look now more into what actually um, lighting devices are and what are the specific challenges that um, you can solve um, with a simulation um, afterwards. So first, let's take a look at what actually is an LED lighting device. Um, I think this is um, rather straightforward. So um, LED light emitting diodes, right, are simply semiconductors where we are um, using the photons that are emitted in the process um, in the range of visible light. So um, why are this? We can um, produce light at any wavelength, so we can really select this and, and use it. But um, there's uh, some more, even uh, more important um, advantages that LEDs bring over, um, for example, CFL or incandescent light um, bulbs. Um, and that is um, first and foremost that they have a, a much high, uh, less energy usage or a higher performance essentially. Um, while we are talking for the other um, parts, rather 80, 90% of the power being lost as heat. Um, this is for LEDs rather only 75% and um, around 15% is really transmitted or is used for the optical performance, while in the other ones we usually are below 10%. So we have simply a higher efficiency for LEDs, which is really the main reason why also the LED 
industry is growing and taking over um, the market for, for many applications. But there's, um, as I mentioned, other advantages um, also that, um, that usually LEDs are operating at very low temperatures and um, the lifetime is uh, another advantage that it has. We will also look later on in the challenge part of the presentation into um, how we can actually classify and how we can improve uh, this lifetime. Um, now, looking into the industries, essentially, where LED plays a big role, um, that is essentially all applications for lighting, um, from the traditional um, lighting industries for interior or exterior lighting, like street lamps or um, in-house um, lighting devices that usually um, are just mounted. We have natural convection cases, but also for uh, mobile um, uh, applications, so like displays or um, lighting devices in um, automotive headlights or rear lamps. Um, and obviously, we also have, apart from the traditional um, industries, we have some fast growing, very innovative industries. So, for example, UV LEDs are used um, as grow lights, they are used in water purification processes. We have um, LEDs um, in, the, in the medical um, solution where UV lights are also um, used. So, essentially, through the whole um, lighting uh, market, LEDs play a big role, but also it's expanding essentially, and in the innovative industry industries, it's heavily applied. So um, all, let's already dive essentially into what an LED lamp looks like, um, or what are the main components of it. Um, if you look at here an example, an LED bulb, um, it would be very similar, similar for an LED panel or other devices. We usually have our LED chips, as we can see here in the middle of the screen. We have a diffuser or a lens, we have a reflector, um, and then we have essentially um, a heatsink and the casing. And in many cases, the heatsink and the case, casing is just one component. Sometimes it's also separated. And then we have a base where essentially the electric current can be attached uh, to the device. If we um, look more into this in detail, so in a more schematic view of it, um, we can see that now the LED itself can be um, also looked into in detail. So that we have here also um, inside a lens, we have the LED um, diet, we have um, the dye attachment to the heat slug, the ceramic package, etc. But we put this all essentially, essentially into one box as for most lighting manufacturers, the LED chips are simply bought. They, are, um, they come from other uh, manufacturers. Um, or suppliers. And in the simulation, this is very similar. So in simulation, we do not treat the LEDs usually as a um, very detailed geometric small piece, but we rather take here a representation of the LED and either we model it simply as a solid with a power source or we model it um, if we have the from the manufacturer or supplier the uh, relevant information uh, given. We use a power network, um, so a thermal resistance network model to model the LED and that is not represented in the geometry. What we have represented in the geometry are the lower parts that we can see here. So we have a PCB usually um, just with one dielectric layer and then a metal core um, to optimize obviously for the heat loss um, of the LED package. And then on the outside, we have a heat sink in whatever way it might be put. What you can see on the right is also that in this schematic view, we can kind of combine some of these components and give them some separate thermal resistance values. And that is also what you might be optimizing for. So if you know, um, if you have a target temperature for your um, LED junction, um, and you know the the thermal resistances of the LED chip to the board and the board itself, then you can also pick a um, a heat sink that fulfills the criteria and where we can ensure that you actually reach this target temperature um, or you can design your own heat sink accordingly. Um, on the next slide now, we um, see the first challenge. Um, so there's multiple challenges, um, but one that is very prominent and that is related to the junction temperature is that the optical performance decreases the higher the temperature of the junction gets. Um, and obviously, we want to have a um, high optical performance, as high as we can actually get. Um, and to measure this or to um, yeah, classify it, we can look at the light output and measure it as luminous flux. Um, and then to make it more or easier to grasp essentially how the um, temperature 
um, influences exactly this luminous flux. It's all often given in graphs as a relative number. So kind of we take now at reference conditions, like for example, 25 degrees, so like room temperature, um, we take um, the light output and now we look at how is the lighting output working um, for higher temperatures and lower temperatures and rate this relative to this reference point, right? And we can see here essentially that at 25 degrees, we now have here 100% light output, so just the standard as we define it. And if we now look to the right, which is the more interesting part, um, as usually our operating range for the LED might be something like um, minimum 50, if not 60 to 75 degrees Celsius. Um, then we see that for uh, independent of the color of the light, we will see for all of them the lighting output actually decreases, the performance decreases, and that means um, that this is obviously an important factor for us, so we want to keep the temperature lower to also have this decline in lighting output not as significant, um, and take this kind of for our um, study that we will see in a few minutes. We take this as an input, right? So the lower the chip temperature, obviously, the better for our optical performance, but also the lower the chip temperature, um, the better it is for us essentially to work with our LED over time. So it does not decrease only because of the uh, chip temperature in general, but also the lifetime decreases. So um, if you look at uh, the next chart for this. The LED lifetime is here shown again um, as, a, as a lighting output. This time we take as a reference point not a specific temperature, we take as a reference point the lighting output at the beginning, right? So uh, when essentially we switch on the light for the first time and now we see that um, independent from the junction temperature that we have, we have here green and a red line uh, with 75 and uh, 74 and 63 degrees Celsius. Independent now on which of these we look, we will see that essentially now um, the lighting output decreases. Um, so um, it's important for us to essentially understand how long it takes and um, how good this works out. So if you look in this case, we see that we have um, that we reach 70% of the lighting output, which is all often referred to as L70 and a well um, accepted standard essentially in the industry following this LM80 standard that is mentioned here. Um, this is essentially a point where you look at and see, okay, how long does um, an LED take until it decreases or cuts down um, the 70% mark? And we see that for the 74 degrees Celsius line, we cut it here, so around maybe 15,000 hours. And if you look at the 63 degree um, line, this is much later. So we are around 25,000 hours of lifetime um, later because of 11 degrees. So obviously this is um, 11 degrees less is already a quite challenging task for now for your cooling strategy, but we see how big the impact can be essentially in doing this and that it's actually well worth investing into the cooling strategy um, to achieve more for that. Um, if you go to the next slide for this, we will see what actually angles of attack are out there to now achieve this. Um, so which cooling strategies can we apply? And obviously, as we want to have the heat dissipation being as effective as possible, we want to dissipate heat um, nicely out of the system. We try to make use of all different mechanisms of heat loss, so the conduction, convection, and thermal radiation. And starting in the same order, we have essentially in the beginning, so starting from the LED, we have the LED spacing and the PCB and LED module that we can choose. We can pick from different suppliers and we might just buy the chips or we have an LED module already with multiple mounted chips. That's what we can decide if we decide for um, buying only chips. The LED spacing is already one of the design parameters we have. We want to space them on the board in a way that um, they don't influence each other um, very much. Otherwise, um, the heat dissipation through the board might not be sufficient essentially, and we might um, have high junction temperatures. For the PCB in general, as it is one of the very low conductive components in the whole assembly, it's very important that this is um, done uh, in an efficient way. That's why for lighting devices, we often see metal core uh, PCBs because they ensure um, even in that case, for a higher conductivity and a better heat loss via conduction. The same 
um, accounts for the thermal grease material. We want to mount now the board as uh, good as possible to the heatsink. And in the heatsink, we usually now have a very high conductive material like um, aluminum. So here, um, this is very efficient. And now we want to get the heat out of essentially the whole assembly. So the heatsink and um, doing this, we have uh, two different parameters again that we can influence. We can use some surface finishing on the surfaces essentially um, to influence the thermal radiation. So thermal radiation in an application where we have natural convection will often account for as much as um, 20 to 30 percent of the total heat loss, so very significant. And obviously, that depends on the emissivity of the material. So we're trying essentially to improve this. That's why also um, heat sinks have often black colors. Um, and um, this is one of the parameters we can influence. And very obviously, and maybe the biggest one that we can influence is the um, design of our heat sink. So how many fins, how thick the fins are, um, can we extend them, can we optimize them so that the convective flow field that is um, essentially driven by the, by the buoyancy forces of uh, density changes due to temperature, that this actually really um, becomes an efficient way of cooling it. And if this is not enough, we can even go for active cooling solutions like we have them maybe for more advanced um, and high power devices like in the medical industry or automotive headlights often already have some uh, fans attached as well. So we can go for active cooling instead of just natural uh, convection and try to cool down the LED for this as well. And now looking at all of these cooling strategies, obviously there's a lot of things you can try, you can turn around, you can iterate on, and we will see now um, when I pass over to Anor how we can actually use simulation to do exactly that and how we can optimize best doing simulation in exactly these applications. Anor, can you take it from here? Yeah, I will, yes. Okay, so as Alex said, uh, this is a very uh, important challenge when it's about designing LED lighting devices. Um, so let's have a look at how cloud CFD, cloud-based CFD can help um, um, can help the, the, the design. It can be a very useful tool to assess this thermal performance. So first of all, uh, it's an all-in-one solution, which means uh, you can uh, upload your, uh, your CAD, you can simulate it, and uh, you can analyze the results online. So you have access to all these tools from your browser and you can uh, run multiple simulations at a time. We're going to see that, uh, how it compares to traditional uh, options. You can obviously uh, leave your uh, uh, computer off while it's running, and that's, uh, that's an advantage. You don't have also uh, the restriction that comes with hardware and software updates, for example. So how, how does that um, more in detail uh, impact your uh, the, the design workflow and what you can uh, how, how you can uh, be helped by this? So you can design obviously different heatsink designs like uh, like Alex said, uh, going from uh, fins to pins, um, try to change the material uh, and the different types of active cooling. You can, uh, this will help you select the right, uh, for example, the right fan for the job if you are, if we're talking about active cooling. And we can um, obviously with CFD visualize not only the thermal distribution, the, the temperature distribution, but the convective uh, flow. So we can visualize and we can understand where there are uh, zones of recirculation, where there are zone of stagnation and the heat, for example, doesn't get carried uh, by the airflow, for example. So we can really see, and I'll show you in a minute on the platform and, and the small project we have, how, how we see that. Obviously, if we're talking about an enclosure, we can obviously assess the pressure drop created uh, from the inlet to the outlet. So how does that compare, how does cloud simulation compare to physical testing and in-house simulation? So first of all, physical testing, you have to uh, create a physical prototype that you have to sometimes send away to a third party um, company that, that is going to be carrying out the testing and it will take probably days or even a week sometimes and the cost can be uh, quite high. Um, where you can also simulate uh, this in-house with your local hardware and but you will be limited to a number of it of design 
and you will be also limited uh, to, uh, it will take more time. So with cloud simulation, we have an unlimited number of design iterations we can run at the same time. So if, if you run 10 or 50 different design, it will take the same time as just only one. And this as a fraction of the price. So let's have a look at how we apply this uh, into a small product. Uh, I prepared for you a very simple uh, simulation where we're going to analyze the cooling of an LED spotlight. Uh, it's a typical LED spotlight you find in, in most uh, households. And we're going to analyze uh, how it dissipates the energy, how it, it dissipates the thermal energy, and how the temperature is distributed. The main idea here is to know uh, is to evaluate the temperature at the chips because we see that it's an important factor uh, for uh, for the lifetime of the uh, of the device. So how hot are the chips, and if they are too hot, what are what can we try to make them uh, to 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 cool them a bit better? Can we change the material properties? Would that help? If yes, by how much? And can can we try a different heatsink design? And does it help? And if yes, by how much? Okay, so it's a very simple geometry here I have prepared uh, with a core that is also acting as a, a circular heatsink. And uh, we have at the back uh, a connector pin, which is a, a very common uh, GI type kind of connector for, uh, for this kind of LED spotlight. Um, we have five, uh, seven, sorry, seven uh, LED chips that emit about one watt for each of them. We have a lens at the front, and at the back of the uh, LED chips, uh, we have the PCB. In terms of the material, uh, I've selected uh, the properties of a, a specific grade of aluminium that is used for heat sinks, and, uh, the, uh, and the rest are a standard material, apart from the PCB, which, uh, as Alex mentioned, is a very important uh, component in terms of conductivity. So we will see that the um, conductivity values for this material uh, will have different uh, par, um, uh, different components, whether you are in the plane in, in the plane or through the plane. So cooling the LED spotlight, what are we? What is the setup like? So as we said, it's a natural uh, or passive convection. So there's no no fan blowing on anything. So we're only relying on the air density difference between the hot and the cold zone for the flow to be driven. Uh, the spotlight is entirely surrounded by air. So for this specific uh, case, we have not attached it to any ceiling or to any mounts or anything, any brackets. We made a few exemptions here. So the chips are simple blocks, but there's no specific directional thermal resistance. In some cases, you can use a thermal uh, resistance network and where you can reuse the uh, manufacturer's uh, directional thermal resistance to, uh, to, uh, to be implemented for, for the simulation. So we can also use that. Uh, the spotlight core is, is full. So there's no cavity where you would usually uh, have a, a, drive, a driver in it that will control um, a number of parameters. So this is a perfect example, as we mentioned in the first slide, to introduce our new conjugate heat transfer analysis. So this comes very handy. It's an in-house uh, prepared solver that is particularly suited for parallel application, parallel job. So why is this more performant? The, it solved the energy equation throughout the whole domain. So it, does, it's, it solved everything at once. So fluid and solid. So in this way, we can compute, it can compute the heat information, therefore the buoyancy, a lot faster and the navier stokes equation a lot faster than with the uh, former CHT solver. Uh, we developed this having in mind that we know that natural convection problems are a, especially a big challenge for people in the electronics uh, cooling industry and particularly for a lighting application. So this is particularly uh, efficient in this kind of problem that you're seeing here. So I'll bring you to the platform now and I'll show you very quickly the main few steps that I took for setting up this uh, simulation. 
So we are now on the uh, on the platform, uh, and you can see that I'm on my internet browser. I'm connected to SimScale. I have opened the uh, the project. I see that it's just a cube, but uh, if I hide the flow region, I will just see my LED spotlight, as you see here, with all the components. So basically, the problem is very well. Uh, we can we can set up set this up uh, very quickly. Uh, the we need to evaluate, as I said, the thermal dissipation in the solid and the fluid. Therefore, we need to understand what are the interface between the components themselves. But this is done automatically. You see that there's interfaces that are automatically recognize as soon as I create the simulation. To create the simulation, you go on the simulation tab and you click the plus button here. And this is the conjugate heat transfer V2. And the description is uh, more or less what I uh, explained earlier. I can create a simulation and it populates a tree here. Uh, it, it detects the contact, as I said, automatically. What we can do afterwards is uh, we can go back here and uh, we can start by assigning the air volume, for example, to our region. There's an air volume inside, by the way, in front of the chips. And going through assigning component uh, material to the component, so aluminium to the core, and brass for the connector base, and so on. What I wanted to show you now, to show you now, is how the PCB is set up. You see that we have two arrows showing up on the screen, and uh, we can select different um, values for uh, the thermal connectivity. Then I can go on to the boundary condition, and the boundary condition is essentially, if I highlight the flow region, the boundary condition is essentially uh, in the upper and lower region, and we can assign the air to, to flow freely, and this is essentially what it says. After this, I go on to advanced concept and power sources, and I click on the absolute power sources, and I see that if I hide this again, and I go back here, I see that I've assigned a heat flux of one watt on each of the chips here. So there's seven watts in total dissipated by the uh, thermally by the chips. Then I can, uh, and then I'm kind of ready to go. Uh, I can obviously um, uh, select the average of the temperature at the junction of the, uh, of, I'll show you in a moment. I can zoom in here and I can uh, select the junction, the temperature between the chips and the, and the, and the board. And this will tell me, and uh, this can be recorded and I can evaluate how the, um, the temperature evolves with the iteration because CFD is in uh, most CFD solvers, it's an iterative process. And I can check if the temperatures have converged to a definite value and if the, the solution is numerically stable. So I can record these phases and obviously I can uh, probe some points throughout the domain as you can see here, and I can um, um, monitor these values as well, whether it's in the fluid or in, in, the, in the solid. What I can do as well is I can click here, and if I, by any chance, I have a question, I want to highlight something, if I have an issue and I don't understand anything, uh, I can uh, start a conversation with any of our application engineer, and they will reply within a few minutes and guide you through this uh, the whole process. You can share your project with them, and they will assist you. So don't hesitate, please. So if I go to my simulation runs, I see that I've already uh, done one run, and I'm going to dive into the solutions and the type of, uh, of simulation result we can get from CFD. So basically, uh, we will find this in a, in a slide, but this is one of the pictures I've extracted, which represents the distribution on the vertical plane of the, of the LED a temperature. Uh, we can also have a look at velocity streamlines, and this gives a good indication on how uh, what path is taking the uh, the airflow and uh, the colored uh, the colors re represent um, the velocity and on the heat sink it represents the temperature so it accelerates uh, as it leaves uh, the upper part of the heat sink then another plot uh, representing also uh, a cutting plane through the, the, the vertical uh, vertical slice and sh also showing a velocity 
On this one, I can actually see it's a cut through the, the, the core and I can see uh, the velocity and if the uh, air is being carried and if there's enough airflow between the fins. So let's go back to the slides and I'll show you a couple more results and how we can identify problems and we can evaluate quantities. So let's go back. So let's dive into the result. So what do we have for the specific setup? I can uh, evaluate the temperature of the chips, 114 for the center chip and 108.35 for the uh, uh, peripheral uh, chips. This is quite high in general, and I think manufacturers don't uh, recommend such high temperatures with the max being 120, at which uh, the driver will uh, cut off the uh, LED to prevent damage. So how, does, uh, how can we uh, use CFD to target potential problems in the design? So first problem is the hotspot around the PCB. You see that there is a zone. I will try to highlight this here. There's a zone here where the heat doesn't, doesn't really transfer uh, through the board. This, it, it, should, it should be able to, to be carried away a lot better here uh, and towards the, the, the outside of the heat sink. So this is one of the first, you see that it carries a lot, a lot more heat in this direction than in that direction, obviously because the conductivity is different. We will see how much of an impact this has on the result. So this is the first problem we can, uh, we can highlight here. Uh, we can see the different temperature gradients uh, and see uh, where the hot spots are and where the colder zones are and how, uh, how the heat gets uh, extracted as it flows upward. On the second plot, I wanted to bring more information about the flow pattern. And what you can see here is that the flow uh, really struggles to get in. I'll going, I'm going to highlight this again. Really struggles to get inside uh, the fins, as you can see, as you could also see it on the platform. Uh, and it really slows down and struggles to extract the heat. So you can really visualize this kind of information. It gets really slow in the center here. Accelerate around here. So we can uh, really um, th um, reconsider how uh, probably to extend the, the, the space between the fins and see uh, how we, uh, if, it, if it improves the uh, evacuation, the, the dissipation of the heat. Okay, so uh, as, an, as an example, I'm going to highlight the, the importance of the PCB connectivity as we, uh, as we uh, mentioned before. So I started uh, with um, the, 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 uh, the original uh, values for the, for the connectivity, and then I, I changed it quite a bit and see how much is going to impact the temperature at the chips. So you see the difference. So with uh, a, a factor, kind of a factor of two, we lose around 18 degrees on the chip. So this is a very, very sensitive value that uh, obviously we, is limited by quite a number of, of, of factors and there's different layers in the, in the PCB and different uh, materials to take into account. But this can all be simulated uh, with SimScale. Uh, this means, for example, we could save um, thousands of hours uh, for, of, of lifetime if this, if this was a, a realistic case, which is not uh, uh, obviously, but it's just to illustrate uh, this, this kind of uh, um, important factors. Second important factor is going to be uh, the heating design. As Alex mentioned, it's very important and we can simulate multiple, multiple designs at the same time. Um, for the for the specific example, I changed the original design uh, by um, halving the uh, number of fins and doubling the thickness. So I wanted to have more air to go between the fins. So I increased the the, the spacing between the fins, and I wanted to have more heat uh, in the fins. Uh, so this is why I doubled it. 
So basically, we can really uh, the idea to to improve the heatsink is uh, in overall to increase the surface area with air in contact with air, and obviously uh, allowing more airflow uh, to extract this heat. Obviously. So in this case, changing the heatsink design didn't come as a, a very a significant uh, performance uh, optimization. We we uh, we cool down by by 1.1 degrees Celsius, which is not huge, but you can quantify these values, which any of the heat sinks design uh, you simulate on the platform. In summary, what have we learned? The thermal management of lighting components, lighting devices, is paramount is essential in order to guarantee that the LED device is going to work for the required amount of time. You can do this, thankfully, with CFD, and you can simulate different material properties. You can simulate different geometries, different configuration, different operating condition. We have only one operating condition here, which is natural convection at 20 degrees, but obviously you can change the orientation and you can uh, you can evaluate the differences. Um, so we can do all this with CFD and all this on the cloud with no installation of software requires and no updates of software required. Um, I think we're approaching the end of this webinar. Um, I'll leave a, a bit of extra for the question. Obviously, Alex, if you want to uh, add a few bits to that, but uh, I also uh, added some references uh, for you to, uh, if you want to get more information about the standards in place, about how people talk about the heat dissipation in LED lights. Thank you very much for following this webinar. Um, I was very happy to, uh, to present this with Alex. Uh, Alex, uh, you can also uh, say a few words and we can take the question as well. Yeah, thanks also from my side. Um, it was a pleasure to present. Um, I have a, a small question that was posted essentially when uh, Arno showed uh, the new solver. So the question essentially is, is it already available to everybody? And that is the case. So if you already have a account on SimScale and you were using, for example, beforehand the, the conjugate heat transfer, you can simply now see on top of it the coupled uh, uh, conjugate heat transfer v2.0 and that exactly means essentially that this is the new solver and there's also a likeliness this will be um, yeah thanks for showing again this will yeah. be um, likely replaced by the new implementation once all of the features are um, equivalent um, simply because um, the performance is so much better okay um, we have I think also another question about uh, asking how do I uh, do a completely new simulation? Do I have to do a completely new simulation for each design change? So the answer is no. What you can do, and I will show you quickly on the platform how it works. What you can do here is that I have a simulation setup already completed. What I can do is I can go next to the tree item and I can click duplicate. It duplicates all the parameters, all the material properties, all the boundary conditions. What I need to do is simply go to the geometry tree item and I will change with the uh, CAD model I have uh, imported already. You will need to uh, assign the different um, component, the different volumes, but the parameters and will be kept. I don't know if we have uh, other questions. Feel free to ask or any comments and any question. By the way, we also have, so we were talking about here about uh, natural convection. We will have a few more public projects uh, for forced convection where there is an LED light that is uh, cooled down uh, by uh, either fans or by uh, liquid cooling. So uh, stay tuned, we uh, on a regular basis post uh, public uh, projects that you can duplicate on your dashboard and, and use as a template. 
Great. I guess, I guess if there are no more questions, I know we can wrap it up, right? So we yeah. say thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, see you next time. See you next time, guys. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening.